Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Automated Discovery of um, Cancer Types from Genes uh, by Shruti. Uh, please remember to hold off uh, your questions uh, until the end of the talk, where you can uh, say Shruti outside in the hallway if you have any questions. Um, or you can uh, reach out to her on uh, Twitter and uh, ask her any questions that you may have. Go ahead, Shruti. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Shruti, um, and uh, my talk is The Automated Discovery of Cancer Types from Genes. Um, and so just a little bit about myself before I get into the talk. I'm a high school junior, so 11th grader, at Hathaway Brown School in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and I'm really interested in coding. I um, learned Python from Code Academy and Code.org um, in sixth grade and have been coding with my dad since. Um, of course, back then it was more like make a pig Latin translator, but um, that definitely grew my love for coding and that's definitely something that I see as a long-term career. So, to get into my talk. Um, okay, so the problem. So current strategies for cancer diagnosis are limited in many ways. So although we've made a lot of progress in the way that we choose to diagnose and treat cancer, there's still a lot of gaps, um, especially, so two of the current methods are by organ of origin and type of spread. So organ of origin specifically has two big problems in that if you categorize something as brain cancer, um, different, uh, sorry, the same organ can have different types of cancer and different organs can have similar types of cancer. So if you say something is only brain cancer or only kidney cancer, you cut out all of the interconnected relationships that could be there between these cancer types. Um, and that's a problem because that also limits the way that you treat them. So a biological example, so older cells in the body are more likely to become cancerous. And so mature cells in the stomach um, pancreas, liver, kidney, um, they all activate through the same, a similar gene path. And so if you say that um, cells in those, mature cells in those organs, if they become cancerous and you only label them as stomach cancer or kidney cancer, um, the types of cancers that they progress to um, are actually really related. So if you only call them as one specific type of cancer, again, you're missing out on all of those um, interconnected relationships and patterns that you could be um, using to help diagnose and treat it. Um, additionally, cancer is kind of a big umbrella. It's a big umbrella term, and so there's tons of different types of cancers um, under this umbrella. So carcinomas, leukemias, lymphomas, multiple myelomas, sarcomas, uh, melanomas, and there's tons more. And these are more specifically, um, more, spe more specifically categorized by the way that they progress. So um, a carcinoma or a leukemia is very specific, but if you just say brain cancer, again, you're missing out on, um, because the brain itself can have carcinomas or sarcomas. There's so many different um, types of cancer specifically that if you just call it as one overarching term, um, again, you're missing out on so many um, benefits that you could gain by exploring it more deeply. And one last note on that, chemo drugs, when you use them, um, and drug plans and drug treatment plans need to be um, specialized to the patient. And so, again, if you're, uh, going back to the brain cancer example, if you only call something as brain cancer, um, you're missing out on all of the um, things you could gain by trying to um, explain it or figure out a different way to classify it. So um, these are just different types of chemo drugs used, and so it's really important to know the specific cancer you're working with um, when you're treating it and figuring out a treatment plan. So the goal of my project and the goal of this presentation is finding a different way to classify cancer types. Um, but that's much easier said than done, so to explore some of the facts. So when looking for something, oh, Okay, <laughs> when looking for something different to, um, something that differentiates cancer cells from regular healthy cells, um, Things scientists have found that uh, cancer cells express genes much differently than regular somatic cells or body cells do. So this is a healthy cell, um, and it undergoes some genetic changes, genetic mutations to become a cancerous cell. And so that cancerous cell then goes, undergoes rapid, unregulated cell division to form this cancerous tumor. And so because of that, the way that it expresses genes and the way that um, its gene expression is just fundamentally different than a regular healthy body cells. And so that offers um, a method that we can maybe try to classify through that. So that begs the question, why not use gene expression data? And so the challenge and the reason that we're not already doing that is because 
a gene expression profile is very wide and it's unable to be easily understood or interpreted by a human. So um, just the combinations of these gene sets and this gene profile are really hard to understand and they're really large, so you can't understand them easily. Um, so the human body has approximately 40,000 active genes and so genes interact with each other in very complicated mechanisms that we don't know much about. So genes don't work in isolation, which is why they're especially hard for humans to understand. Um, they work in these things that we call cohorts or gene sets. And so this is um, especially hard for humans to try to understand, interpret, and work with. So what if we built a computer model of it? Of course, it has to do something with Python, something with machine learning, or something with computers. That's why we're here. So um, the idea. So machine learning um, is, again, an umbrella term. <laughs> an umbrella term um, typically uses something called supervised learning. So supervised learning um, could be used to find direct correlation between genes and cancer types. And that sounds really ideal. Um, until we run into the big issue because um, supervised learning is pretty limited because it needs three main things. Um, one, it needs labeled data, it needs accurate labels, and it needs a lot of data. And so in the situation that this, um, this project is in, <coughs> excuse me, um, we only have about 11,000 um, examples to work with. And that may sound like a lot until you realize that when you're working with something like 30 cancer types, um, each type is going to need at least 1,000 examples. So you're already at 30,000 examples, which is much more than what we have to work with. Um, and so that already doesn't fit, you know, the lots of data. And also labels. So labels are a big problem here because we're trying to get away from using labeled data because the labels that come with, these, with the cancer data is based on organ of origin. So that label will say that's stomach cancer, that's kidney cancer, which is exactly what we're trying to stay away from. So um, because of these, we can't use supervised learning for this project. So that asks the question, can a machine learning algorithm automatically discover subtypes? And so in enters unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning um, is often used when you don't have a lot of data or labeled data. And there's two main types um, that are talked about, so clustering and dimensionality reduction. So clustering is automated class discovery and dimensionality reduction is automated feature extraction, both of which are things that we're trying to do um, when you're trying to find new cancer subtypes. But um, 40,000 dimensions, or those 40,000 genes that are active in the body is still, way too, is still really large for a computer to process and for a computer to work with. Um, so instead, we could try to select 5,000 of the most active genes or the most active dimensions, but this is still really big. Um, and there are interactions between these genes. Because the end goal is obviously using a computer is really helpful, but when you have a doctor and a patient, um, you really need to get it into some kind of format that a doctor can understand and interpret, and 5,000 uh, 5, genes, 5,000 dimensions is still really big for that. So we need to find a way to reduce this number. So the solution comes um, in the form of something called an autoencoder. So an autoencoder is a type of deep neural network um, that can take 5,000 dimensions or a 5,000 dimensional data set and reduce it into 36 dimensional data set and then reconstruct that back into that 5,000 dimensional data set. Um, and so if you think about it, it's really powerful because that 36 dimensional data set is something that's small enough that um, interpretable enough that a human can work with or a doctor can work with. Um, and it also contains the most important data points, which is why um, when you see that you reconstruct it, it means that it has to have the most important points that you're able to reconstruct it from. Um, and so here's something that, uh, that's a little bit more of what the structure looks like. That first part is called an encoder. It um, reduces the dimensions down to 36. And then you have your code in the middle, so called a latent space. And then you have a decoder that, again, brings it back up to that 5,000 dimensions. So a good way to think about it is if somebody gives you a picture of a cat, and they're like, OK, I want you to draw this cat for me. Um, you only have five minutes to look at this picture of a cat. So you're going to look at the most important features, right? You're going to look at the whiskers and the pointy ears and where the cat is sitting and how it's sitting. Um, and you need to be able to pick out all of those most important features so that when you're painting this picture or drawing this picture, you can have those features in it. Um, and the really cool thing about an autoencoder is that it automatically figures out what those features are. So you don't have to tell it, look for the whiskers, look for the ears. It automatically figures that out. So that's really powerful and really useful um, when you're working with such large data sets. 
So autoencoding is therefore complete because it captures the whole thing and it can reconstruct it, but it's also concise because it gives you that 36 dimensional representation, which is really important. So it sounds ideal, right? Unfortunately, not quite. So autoencoders also tend to memorize the data and they fail to generalize when presented with a different data set. Um, this specifically happens when there aren't enough examples because um, what it's trying to do, if you can go back to this picture, um, you see in the middle it says code. So that's where it's writing the code to try to reconstruct it. It's saying draw the whiskers here, draw the ears here. So when you're doing that, um, if you don't have enough examples, the autoencoder can easily write a code that's just kind of hard coding it. That's just saying, um, that's just reminding it of the exact example that it's working with if you don't have enough examples. Um, and so then if you provide it with a new example, next time you give it a dog, it's not going to try to pick those most important features and do that, it's just gonna redraw a cat again. Um, and so if you have a lot of examples, autoencoders tend to work really well, but um, especially in this situation where there's not, um, that doesn't work. So instead, um, we can use something called variational autoencoding. So variational autoencoding follows the same general structure but what it does is it learns to associate slightly perturbed versions of each example to the example itself. And so you can see here you have the sigma and the mu values, which are variance and mean. So you calculate those two and you use them to choose how much you want to perturb the data. So you need to perturb it enough or basically change it enough that your computer can't memorize it but not too much that you're straying too far away from the um, original data set. And so those two um, choose how much you're gonna perturb it, that uh, Gaussian circle of how much you're gonna perturb it, and um, they establish that range. And so this forces the model to come up with a code that's continuous, so you can apply it to other examples, so you're not just memorizing the data. Um, and so therefore, variational autoencoding is complete, it's concise, but it's also continuous. So, Getting into the background, so the Green Lab at UPenn has successfully applied variational autoencoders to a cancer data set, and they published it in a paper called, um, entitled Extracting a Biologically Relevant Latent Space from Cancer Transcriptomes with Variational Autoencoders. So this paper was published in 2017, um, and as I said before, they apply a variational autoencoder to a cancer data set. Um, and so what I've done is I've recreated these results and I've also extended them into some, um, some fun new angles. So they've published all of their code in an open source um, database called Tybalt on GitHub. You can look it up, it's the Green Lab um, Tybalt set and it's training and evaluating a variational autoencoder for pan-cancer gene expression data. So to get into the data, so the data comes from the Cancer Genome Atlas or the TCGA. Um, which is a program that's under the National Institute of Health, specifically the National Cancer Institute. And so what the TCGA has done is they've compiled something called the Pan-Cancer Atlas. So that means across, cancer, across cancers, they've analyzed over 11,000 tumors among 33 of the most prevalent cancer types. And they've separated this information and this data into three um, big categories cell of origin pathways, oncogenic processes, and signaling pathways. And so you can go, um, anybody can go, it's all open source, find the data and download it and work with it. So in the data set, um, so this is an example of a sample um, data set, what comes with it. So <coughs> this first thing is the sample ID, that's each patient or each tumor. Um, and it also gives information, their gender, their race, ethnicity of the patient, the organ that it was found in, and its acronym, and also the specific disease, right? So um, that's especially important because saying, again, that just going back to the idea that just saying stomach cancer is not enough. Specifically, stomach adenocarcinoma is very different than other types of stomach cancer. So um, whether the patient is alive, whether it's a primary tumor, so the first tumor that grew in the body, or a metastas uh, or a metastasis, um, a tumor that spreads somewhere else in the body, the age of diagnosis, um, the drug use, the year of diagnosis, the stage, it comes with a lot of really important information. Um, but not all of this is necessary for the specific project that you're working with, I just wanted to show you what it generally comes with. So the overall approach. Um, so the first step is processing the data. As you saw, it comes with a lot of columns and a lot of um, data that's not necessarily um, useful for the specific project I was working on, so um, getting rid of those columns, but as well as, um, like I said before, selecting the 5,000 most active genes. So 40,000 genes, of course, is too large um, for 
to try to work with. And so instead, choosing those 5,000 most active genes, and the way that that's chosen is by seeing, uh, choosing the ones that have the highest level of variance, so the ones we're going to be able to gain the most information from. Um, the next step was normalizing the values between 0 and 1 so that a neural network could be applied. Um, the second big step is building and training the VA using Keras. So Keras is a neural networks library in Python. Um, and this VAE was used, the variational autoencoder, was used to um, compress the 5,000 dimensions into 36 dimensions, which um, we are guessing. The reason that that says hopefully meaningful is because the idea of a variational autoencoder is that middle step is that most concise, um, complete version of the data. So it has the most, everything is condensed into those 36 dimensions. Um, and so hopefully, um, those are clinically meaningful. So I can't comment on that. Obviously, I'm not an oncologist. But the idea is that because it's condensed everything into such a small um, dimensional data set, that that holds um, a lot of useful information for oncologists. So the next step, of course, would be working with an oncologist to see is that actual useful information? Are they actually gaining something from that? Um, and that's why it says hopefully meaningful. And just a quick note that all of the work um, done here was done on Jupyter Notebooks um, on Google Collab. So the specific experiment, so once the variational autoencoder is built, you need to test whether it's actually working or not, obviously. So um, there are two big ways that I did this, uh, evaluating the VAE's latent representation. So making sure that that 36-dimensional data is actually correct and actually um, working and useful. So one way is visualization. So that's showing, does it show natural clusters learned without labels? Again, it's really important to remember that the VA wasn't given labels. So it's um, on the point of using unsupervised learning is seeing, is it able to find patterns in the data itself? Is it able to see, um, oh, these kinds of cancers are related? Um, and so that's showing, is it useful and is it meaningful? And then classification is, can it be used to identify cancer types? That's checking, is it actually true? Like, is, it, is the way that it's reconstructing it actually right? So it's testing, is it complete, and is it reliable? Is it getting all of the most important information, and is it getting it correctly? So to start with the visualization, um, I created what's called a TISNI plot, or a T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. So basically what a TISNI plot is, is it organizes data, it takes um, data from some 36 dimensional or whatever dimensional data you're working with, and it um, basically reimagines that as a two dimensional approximate neighborhood preserving map. So what that means is it takes all of this um, fancy 36 dimensions that we can't easily understand and instead plots it as a visual graph that um, is more easily understandable and especially important in unsupervised learning and clustering because you can see those clusters. So this is not my um, TISNI, this is just an example of what a TISNI looks like. So this third step was creating the TISNI plot. Um, and so here is actually the first TISNI plot that I generated. And as you can see, there's naturally cl created clusters. So each one of these colors, like the yellow, the um, pink, they're all different cancer, um, they're all different clusters of cancer types. Um, and so it's really important, again, to remember the VAE was trained without any information about cancer type. So everything there is things that it figured out itself based on the gene expression data. So um, you can see most of the, so all of the yellow ones are close together, all of the pink ones are close together. So that shows that it's generally categorizing the same cancer type together, which is good. It's showing that it's doing that correctly. But you can also see there's a lot of overlap between the brown and this um, blue and the red and the green, which are all different cancer types. Each color represents a cancer type, um, which is showing that there are underlying patterns and relationships shown through gene expression um, that these cancers are related. And so if you think about it, that's really useful in saying, because um, we're not limiting it, right? We're not saying like, oh, only put brain cancer together, put this together. Um, and so it's finding these patterns based on gene expression, and it's finding patterns that we might not necessarily find. So the next step was creating an interactive plot. So TISNI is really good for visual visualizing it. Um, but I thought it would be even cooler if you can see specifically each dot um, represents a patient. Um, and so see a little bit more about that. So can I open the plot. Open here. Okay. So this plot was created on um, HiCharts Java framework, JavaScript framework. Um, and each dot is one patient. So you can see this red dot is um, first written is the um, 
cancer, the sample ID, that's just what comes with the cancer genome atlas. And then next is, this one says kidney, renal, clear cell carcinoma. So that's the specific cancer type. And then followed by that is the gender of the patient. Um, and so you can see all of these are um, different cancer types and there's overlap between things like kidney chromophobe and kidney renal um, clear cell carcinoma, which is expected because they are in the same organ. Some of them are going to be related. Um, and, but there's also overlap between um, other cancers that aren't in the same organ, but are related still. So I can get into that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, so this was used, um, so I used Python to generate a JSON graph, uh, generate JSON, and then wrote out the HTML and JavaScript from that. Um, and especially the interactive may be useful to doctors, um, not obviously in this state, but in a more improved state um, for seeing um, are there identifiable patterns or um, finding a new patient, um, do they match one of, the, um, one of the dots up there trying to find valuable information um, between similar patient studies? So a couple of observations. I mostly already mentioned this, but um, patients are automatically plotted in clearly identifiable clusters, even if the cancer type info isn't used in training, which is really awesome. Um, and so all cases belonging to the same type are generally in the same proximity um, or they're in the same cluster. And um, for example, and it is correct because um, GBM, which is glioblastoma multiforme, a cancer of the brain, and lower grade glioma, which is this black and this um, gray, are both really close together, um, which makes sense because both of them are cancers of the brain. Um, and so it puts those together, but also another example is that lung squamous cancer, um, which is this blue one, and esophageal um, carcinoma, which is this black one, sorry, <laughs> um, are both um, have similar gene expression, even though they're not the same organ, which is really cool, um, and it's showing that you are missing things if you only categorize it by what organ it's found in. Um, so next, getting into the classification model. Um, so step four was building that. So that's using the latent representational data. And I used random forest classification and um, I've plotted a confusion matrix. So um, what this is, is um, down here on the bottom is what the true, um, the true cancers are. And here on the left is the predicted guesses. So as you can see, this diagonal is showing the matches. And overall, most of the, um, if the, the larger the numbers along the diagonal shows that it's um, doing well, it's correct. Um, but even the ones that aren't, um, even the ones that aren't zero, which means that it did make mistakes, there's a large number of them, right? So there's like 14 here, 13 here, um, which seems to show that they're not random mistakes, they're common misclassifications. Um, and so that actually could be, um, could hold some promise that um, if there are cancer types that are commonly um, misclassified um, with the, you know, using the classification model, there might be something that's really similar between them, um, and that could offer some kind of insight into treatment plans and things like that. Um, and so further work. So ideas I'm pursuing, the first big one is the, a gene set 36 cancer panel. And so what that is, is it's an x-ray-like visualization of gene expression for diagnostics and treatment of diseases. So basically what this is, is this is glioblastoma multiform, and so these are randomly chosen GBM cases um, from the 36 dimensional latent space, and they're rendered into a six by six um, black and white representation. And so when I did this, um, I found that there seems to be a couple of gene sets, if you will, that seem to always be active in a certain cancer type. So if you take glioblastoma, this one seems to, sorry, this one seems to always, my pointer, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> this one seems to always be active. Um, and there are a couple of little squares that always seem to be white. Um, you can see it forms that little uh, almost T-shape um, in all of the boxes here. And so um, that may hold some meaning and that's definitely something to work with an oncologist and see is this something useful, um, some kind of visual way that you could eas more easily see um, what's actually happening in, in the specific cancer type. Um, and here are two other cancer types, so kidney chromophobe and adrenocortical carcinoma. You can see that there are some boxes that are the same throughout all of them. So again, that's just um, the idea that there may be some gene sets or gene pathways, if you will, um, that are always being activated when that cancer is um, present. So okay, so it makes a pattern, so what? 
So the idea and um, my hypothesis is that a trained physician might be able to, by looking at this or looking at an obviously improved version of it, um, diagnose the type, location, and extent of a cancer just from the gene expression profiling, which could be really powerful because you're getting rid of all of the bias that comes with looking at the organ of origin or the type of spread. You're just looking at actually what the cancer itself is expressing in genes. Um, and so a couple of other ideas I'm pursuing, um, the based on latent representation, which is again that 36 dimensional representation, um, interpretations of that. So does each dimension represent a cluster of interacting genes? Um, just trying to figure out what does that mean? Again, because um, I, I'm not an oncologist, of course, I can't comment on whether it's actually meaningful, but the idea of just exploring that and seeing what that actually means, and is there a way we can change that to make it more useful, things like that. And of course, the final step and the most important part we're doing all of this is to try to figure out how to treat it, right? So figuring out relationships between cancers and drugs, uh, cancers and um, different types of ways that they grow, type of spread, all of that is just so that we can figure out, is there a better way to treat it? What kind of treatment plans can we use? So tying that back into the drug, so analyzing um, drug efficacy based on that latent representation. So finally, POP and OPS. So POP is the power of Python. So I spent a lot of time talking about the biology, um, but obviously none of the project could have been <laughs> done without Python. So all of the tools required for data analysis, modeling, visualization, and imaging are all within Python, which makes it really, really powerful. And the ability to write concise code, right? It's not um, pages and pages long. Concise code that performs fast is really, really powerful. Um, and ops, the idea of open source. So I benefited, obviously, in this project um, by setting hundreds of open source libraries um, and data sets like the Cancer Genome Atlas and libraries like Tybal um, from labs um, at UPenn and other places um, help propel collaboration and knowledge sharing, which is really important. So thank you to Dr. Gregory Way, whose data set and original project that is, and the Green Lab, whose paper that is. So. That's my presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or on LinkedIn or find me in the hallway. Thank you.